So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world. Again, my name is Steven Anderson and I'm one of the founders of EdChat Interactive. Myself, along with Mitch Weisberg and Tom Whitby, uh, wanted to set out to create a new way to help uh, educators from around the globe engage. Webinars are uh, kind of boring, they're kind of stale, they're kind of sit and get, they're kind of the opposite of what we want students to be doing in the classroom. And, and so we, uh, happened to find this platform called Shindig and are setting out to host some innovative professional development sessions for educators around the globe. Uh, I'm excited for uh, for what we are going to hear from today. Um, but first, before we get to our presenter, I want to do a quick little run through of you Shindig as this platform may be new to you. Uh, it uh, it definitely is one of the uh, one of the cooler kind of ways to uh, engage with audiences through a through a live webinar. So as you I'm on what's called the stage. So um, periodically you'll see me turn to the side because I have another computer set up so I can see what you see because I'm in the back end and my, uh, my administrator view looks a little bit different from what you see. Um, but you see my image floating there above the, uh, the sea of, of images of yours and that's called being on the stage. And in a few minutes you'll see Andy come up and, um, and this is where you'll hear him present from. But down along the bottom you see, uh, you see a, uh, some squares, you see some folks on webcam. Those are the other participants that are in the room. So instead of a, a text-based list of participants with names, you actually have images to go along with them. Uh, one of the great things that Shindig does is allow you to form small groups of users to engage with each other, to have conversation. And that's going to be one of the cornerstones of what we do today. So if you hover over your own image, what you'll see are a couple of uh, a couple of different features. One is a mute, so if you have to step away or you have to take a phone call or something like that, just go ahead and set it on mute so you don't disturb anyone else. Um, you also see a, a settings button there that uh, if you're having trouble with your webcam, we of course want to see you. Uh, we want to be able to hear you. You're going to have the opportunity to come up onto the stage to uh, interact and so to have uh, other people hear what you have to say. To make sure that we can hear you. So if you go into those settings and uh, and make sure that everything is working there, you also have IM, which allows you to uh, to IM different participants, send pr other participants messages. When you're in a small group, you can send your small group messages, uh, and then you also have uh, an enlarge where you can make your image larger. One of the best features, though, is you can group up, and the way that you group up is simply clicking on the image of another person. So I'm going to take my image here. And I'm going to uh, to hover over the group that has Tom and in it, and our images will uh, will group together. So now on, you'll see that we have a group of three. We can have as many as five in a group. Um, we ask you don't do more than four because we like to be able to bounce in and out of your conversations. We like to be able to uh, to come in and and see what you're see what you're thinking, see what you're saying. Uh, it allows uh, our presenters to come through and, and engage with you as well. So if you group up, try to keep it to four or less. So what I want you to do right now is go ahead and take just about 90 seconds, click on somebody else's image or click on another group and uh, introduce yourself and tell, uh, tell them where you're from and what you're most excited about to learn from today. Now, as we go through the day, uh, through our, our presentation over the next uh, over the next little while, you'll have plenty of opportunities to group up. Um, don't feel like you can't stay in a group while um, while we're uh, while we're talking or presenting. That's the beauty of the platform. And don't feel like you have to stay in the same group. Um, feel free to bounce around and jump. Go ahead and click on somebody else's 
and interesting. So hello, even if it's somebody that you don't know, you never know what you're going to learn from somebody else. So, uh, so make sure to engage in those opportunities. Um, you also have a couple more buttons there. You've got a raise hand button. Uh, we'll be using that as we go through the day. If once once we start getting into things, uh, that will give you the opportunity to uh, to raise your hand, and that tells me and the back end that you want to come up on the stage. So. Uh, if you if you have something you want to share, and again, we encourage everybody. I will give we can give everybody the opportunity to share. Um, just raise your hand, and that will tell me that I can uh, that I can go ahead and bring you up on the stage. You also have an ask. Um, I'm the only one who can see those, and so but so if you have a technical question or something else, um, you can drop that in there. I mean, I'll try to help you the best I can. Um, but uh, but the questions can also be good if there's anything you want me to pass along to Andy and maybe your mic's not working or something like that you want me to pass on um, to him you can use the questions button and then as we go through um, I'll be brought I'll be showing um, some questions that he's prepared and so if you want to make those larger there will be an icon on that screen you'll be able to make that larger as well so uh, without further ado let's introduce our presenter today so uh, I'm excited. So I've known I've known Andy for for a couple of years. Uh, when he oversaw the launch of the one of the first I, one to one iPad initiatives in the country uh, in Burlington High School um, with uh, the principal Pat there Patrick Larkin, who's now he's he's also moved on. But um, I, I always enjoy reading uh, what what Andrew has to say and um, and and learning from him. And I'm I'm excited about his new book coming out about uh, finding success in um, in these types of programs, and so I'm sure he'll tell you much, much more about that. Um, he's the director of technology at Grafton Public Schools in Massachusetts. You can find more out more about him on andrewmarsinic.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we, I will go ahead and him up and turn the floor over to him. So let's get Andrew up. All right, I think. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's good to see you again, and um, it's good to be here uh, with all of you, uh, sharing the experiences I've had the luxury of having over the past few years in working with uh, schools that are uh, seeking to incorporate more technology um, into the uh, how technology is perceived and how technology is leveraged within the context of a uh, of a classroom. Uh, so this, session, this this talk is going to talk a little bit about the technical aspects about uh, if you're in a district and you're looking to engage in a large or small scale technology initiative, what are some of the questions you should be asking yourself? Uh, who should be involved in this conversation? Um, and, and just what should you be planning for as you go forward? Um, the things I like to share, I always like to share the highlights, but I also like to share the points that didn't go so well. Uh, I feel like those points were not a fail, but they were along this road, along this path. Uh, and also to kind of talk about, uh, my book is called The the One-to-One -One Roadmap, and I, I chose that title purposefully. I, I'm not really good at choosing titles for blog posts or anything, but uh, I felt Roadmap was a good title for this because there's no blueprint for what I'm talking about. Uh, every school has a has a different way of, of bringing in technology. Every school has a different economic structure. Every school has a different population. Uh, so techno there's no one blanket model uh, of technology integration. Uh, but there are some consistent pieces um, that if you're working on the technical end, uh, you'll want to look into to talk about it from the educator standpoint. Uh, because that's primarily who's working with the technology. Uh, and looking at it from a lens from an instructional technology perspective, uh, and also looking at it from a perspective of a classroom teacher, uh, and even talking about uh, some student feedback as far as what we got uh, around how students perceive technology integration uh, down the road. Um, so one of the major themes uh, that I've always worked with and my philosophy around technology and education is that innovation in the classroom, innovation in school begins with trust. Uh, it begins with trust amongst all stakeholders that are involved. Um, the component, uh, there's not going to be a iPad initiative, a Chromebook initiative, a BYO initiative that's going to happen. A uh, perfect example is LA Unified School District. If you've been following along uh, of their iPad initiative they launched a few years ago, um, it went uh, drastically in the wrong direction. 
primarily because they tried to control everything uh, and there was not trust amongst the students and the administration and the staff and all the way up the chain. Uh, so it, while on the, on the surface, the technology, the iPad looked really great, uh, it didn't turn out to be the program that they, I think, set up to work with. Um, I always say if they just would have called me ahead of time, we could have averted all those issues. Um, so ultimately, when you're planning a technology initiative, and when I'm talking about one-to-one, -one, a lot of the time is one-to-one -one is associated directly with an iPad. And while I've worked with iPads for a, good, a vast majority of my career, uh, I've also launched uh, Chromebook initiatives that were close to one-to-one, -one, not quite a one-to-one, -one, uh, throughout an entire district. So. Um, We'll get, we'll get to devices and we'll get to the selection process around that and some of the feedback and some of the um, learning moments that I've had around selecting a device for um, this initiative. So, you know, we start with around going in this direction for technology is, is why are we doing this? Um, I think if, if you're asking yourself this question, you're, you're going in the right direction. Um, if you're asking yourself, we're getting technology because we have to take state tests on it now you're having the wrong conversation. Um, while this is something that is inevitable in all of our schools, that tests and standardized tests will be something that students take now on a, in a digital format, is something that's going to be almost you know, universal across the country, um, it's not the reason why we want to bring technology into schools. Uh, we want to bring technology into schools because it's part of our lives as professionals uh, and it's part of the next phase of our students' lives. Uh, it will be part of their college classroom, uh, it will be part of their work life and beyond. Um, so the, 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 the better we can get ahead of this, um, you know, technology, uh, we need to we need to do it. We need to get as much technology in the hands of our students so that we're teaching them how to use it effectively. We're teaching how to how to use it appropriately, uh, and ultimately, we're fulfilling our mission statements in schools, and we're teaching our students to be. We're sending our students off to be great citizens. And ultimately, that's what we that was what we want uh, in school. Um, just some of the things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give some technical pieces about uh, what I look for and what we kind of the questions we asked the uh, when we were planning our one-to-one, -one, uh, both at Burlington. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit uh, what I worked with at uh, another school district that I worked with, uh, and I've also consulted with uh, a good amount of school districts on one-to-one -one planning. Um, and one-to-one -one, uh, support and professional development, how this, this all, all goes together. Um, so what I'm looking at is when you're beginning this, this conversation around technology, a couple of the questions you want to think about is um, what capacity do we have economically now and over time uh, to support these technology initiatives? Uh, buying technology now as opposed to buying technology 10, 20 years ago is vastly different. Um, anytime you buy new technology, if you're buying the iPad Air 2 today and you're launching it to uh, say 800 students in the next few weeks, which I'm actually doing, um, to supplant our current uh, model of iPad, uh, you have to realize that there's going, there's going to be a new device two to three years down the line. So looking at the economics of it from a, a technology standpoint is something that a, a school district needs to, needs to prepare for. Uh, we can't prepare for a few years or one year of technology or technology in 10 years, we'll come back and see how it's working uh, and then we'll decide to do something again. Uh, it needs to be a yearly conversation. Uh, there needs to be a sustainability plan in place uh, and there needs to be uh, an economic sustainability plan in place so that all of a sudden the technology budget just can cut uh, right away because that ultimately will derail your entire uh, your entire initiative. Um, how do we plan on improving infrastructure now and over time? Going into that other conversation, uh, if you're not looking into your infrastructure from the beginning, if you're not looking at your bandwidth, if you're not looking at your um, AP access points, um, look at all these pieces, if you're not looking at your, your filtering and your uh, capacity to support not only the devices that are coming into students, but the devices that teachers have, the devices that um, you know, everyone has, you know, two to three devices almost per person now. So how are you supporting that and how are you increasing uh, bandwidth and um, and your infrastructure over time so that it's, it can support this? Because the, again, another factor that will ultimately derail uh, a one-to-one -one or any type of technology initiative is if the teachers are in the classroom trying to get something done, trying to accomplish something, trying to try a new application out, what you're going to see is if it's 
working, you're going to lose interest fast. And ultimately, I think it, it will go, go by the wayside. And then the third question that I, I look at when you're in this initial uh, preliminary planning meeting, how will we support teachers, students, and parents over time? I think schools do a good job of supporting teachers and students uh, within technology rich environments. But how are we supporting parents and how are we bringing parents into this conversation? Um, and that's something you have to plan for as well. Um, I do a, a job of reaching out to parents uh, once a month. I, I designed a community tech night. Uh, once a month, we have a focused topic around technology. Uh, we invite parents and all community members to come and, and, and attend a, a presentation slash workshop where we talk to them about what they what they want to know about technology, how they want to, um, how we can help them as, as a school district to support them at home. Um, I think a lot of the times technology, uh, it, it runs so quickly. And I think parents have so much to do within the, the, the span of a day, having to learn applications, having to learn numerous applications uh, and understand where their sons and daughters are, how they're using them um, is, is you know, sometimes an insurmountable task for some parents based on their schedules and uh, the timing of the day. So those are some of the questions um, that I've always tried to look at as far as kind of a three-tiered approach to um, how you are planning uh, this initiative. Um, once you looked at these, these questions, um, I think it's, it's what's essential for school district is to look at, uh, look at a needs assessment. Um, I think this can be done very basically by developing some kind of a, a, a data collection tool uh, that would see what, what teachers want, uh, what, what have they seen, what research have they done around technology, and what are the pieces, what are the components that they're looking for. Uh, I think a technology initiative should never be a top-down decision. It should be a collective conversation uh, with all stakeholders, students, parents, community members, uh, administration, technology directors, you name it, anybody who's involved in a, in a school day and everybody who's externally involved in a school day should be a part of this conversation. Um, it should never be, oops, again, this screensaver went on. It's always great when the technology guy can't use technology. All right, um, so this, this conversation around one-to-one -one should include all the stakeholders in, involved and everyone should have a say and a voice. Um, you should then look at, at staff. Staff are our primary ones, uh, primary people who are going to be using these devices um, on a regular basis. So, how are you going to support them, and what are they looking for? What is their ideal environment? Um, anytime I talk to teachers, and I said, if you could have your, if you could design your ideal classroom, what would it look like? Um, and and I said, if money wasn't an issue, what would your class look like? What would it involve? And I think it's always good to kind of shoot for the top and, and, and think of what, what, do, what do I dream? What does my dream classroom look like? And you'd be surprised how, uh, how good of information that is because you can really get an idea of what, how this teacher wants to practice and how they want to you know, be the best practitioner they can be. Um, but as, a, as someone who's responsible for a tech budget, it gives me an insight into what they're looking for. Uh, and it may be on a grand scale, but at least I can scale that back and give them the resources uh, that they need uh, and provide them with the resources that uh, will help impact uh, student learning. Um, going into you know the, these conversations, what you'll eventually get to um, get to the point. Uh, one of the questions I'm asked most is is how did you select an iPad? How did you select a Chromebook? Um, to go back to the our initial launch at Burlington in, in 2011. Um, we vetted multiple devices. The iPad was not the first choice. Uh, the iPad original, uh, first generation, was the first device and the only device that was out at the moment when we were having these conversations. Um, and eventually, in the spring of, of 2011, the iPad 2 uh, launched. And so, we, at this point, Chromebooks were not really a viable option. Uh, they had started to develop a, a prototype for what a Chromebook would be. I think Rich, Rich Kiker, who my good friend, is had the only Chromebook at that time. <laughs> um, uh, if you ever follow Rich Kiker on Twitter, uh, he's a great one to follow, and he's a he's a Google Google, Google guru, if you will. Um, but uh, you know, he's the one that kept my thinking and thinking, you know, well, you might want to hold off on these iPads because Chromebooks are coming down the line, uh, and they could be transformative just as well. And and they they did. They came they came down the line, and they they. They are a very uh, good competitor for, for um, iPads in the classroom. Um, but going back to that, uh, 
what I've worked in, in, in working in one-to-one -one districts and working in um, districts that are not really sure or don't have the economics to maybe look at a one-to-one, -one, um, the idea of having multiple devices and multiple platforms can be a good thing. Um, however, it takes some time to get. always looked at the idea of starting students and parents all on, all on a singular device uh, to make that transition from uh, having no devices, having no technology in the classroom, to now having a device in the hands of every student. Uh, it helps if everyone's on the same platform, and it also helps with the support and the day-to-day -day professional development that we would we need to provide if we had multiple devices. Um, I've never been uh, into the idea of a, a BYOD, a bring your own device. I think it can happen. Um, I think it, uh, you know, it, it's definitely where we're going. Um, if you look at every college classroom in the country, uh, pretty much a BYOD. Um, so that's, I think, the, the, the next phase of looking at your technology. How do we get to that point? Um, how do we you know, encourage that trust within uh, our students and our communities that we can have students have multiple devices uh, on their person at one time and using those devices um, as an instructional tool? Um, so again, we looked at several different devices. Um, in several initiatives I looked at, I've looked at the iPad. I've even reassessed uh, a one-to-one -one environment at school that I'm currently at was looking at, you know, being in our fourth year into a one-to-one -one with iPads. Uh, we looked into, you know, the Chromebook is the way to, uh, or maybe we look at laptops, maybe we look at MacBooks, you know, so, or maybe we just decide to do a, a BYOD or even maybe a blending of the two. Um, and so, my decision and my thinking around that is that you know the iPad can do a lot of great things. Uh, it can it can be a, a complete video uh, production studio. Uh, it has it has more video and production capacity than Francis Ford Coppola had when he shot the The Godfather. Um, so that's pretty amazing uh, to think of the what students have the ability to do with that kind of device uh, in, in a very streamlined uh, platform. Chromebook, on the other hand, uh, presents a, a, a lot of ways to leverage Google Apps for Education, uh, to leverage different applications that Google Play has and the Google Play uh, for Education Store. But on the same hand, what, what I see with the Chromebook is the Chromebook, while it is mobile, it, it definitely presents the legacy technology design uh, that in, in a classroom setting, um, you know, you can possibly walk in and look into a classroom and besides the Chromebook it doesn't look any different than it did uh, when we all went to school. Um, so one of the things I like to look at is uh, not only the device but le leveraging the, the space in which we have uh, and we're going to talk about design space and, and how you can design your classroom uh, to meet the needs of these new technologies so that you just don't walk into a classroom and see kids sitting in, in rows and in desks all aligned um, with these transformative mobile devices. Um, so those are some of the things to consider um, when you're looking at uh, these devices. Um, iPads and Chromebooks, I think, in a, in a blended environment would work really well together. Um, I think they, they really kind of complement each other. Uh, initially, iPads uh, didn't really run iOS, or um, I didn't run uh, uh, very efficiently. Uh, it was kind of a wonky interface. Uh, they since have uh, Google has since really turned that around. Um, some of the most frequently used apps on my iPad and my iPhone are Google apps. Um, so that says a lot as far as how Google has begun to um, take on this medium of, of an iOS device and really uh, make an impact. Um, so um, the other thing that I'll, I'll mention briefly about, and, and it gets in the way sometimes of, of the planning, is the uh, the payment structure. So I, I've seen some schools where they have tech fees where uh, students will pay a fee month to month. Um, you have some lease to own, you have school purchase, uh, some you have parent purchase. Um, I don't think there's any right one. Um, I think there's, like I said, there's all different economic structures. Uh, in a perfect world, there would be no tech fees. Um, the school would be able to provide the technology, the school would be able to provide the devices. Uh, and that is that is a lot of my thinking around it. Um, the only the only kind of tech fees that we've not even required in in both instances is that uh, we have students buy uh, insurance on their iPad. Uh, so we have both parents and students, um, a, a freshman before they 
iPad they have to come out to uh, the school in the summer. Uh, they have to attend with a parent or guardian. And what they'll do is they'll come in. Uh, we'll give them an overview of our, our philosophy behind the iPad uh, initiative. We'll give them uh, information on what apps they should be looking into uh, and beginning to familiarize themselves with. Uh, we'll talk about our restrictions, our parameters, our security. Uh, we'll reinforce the AUP policy, which is our acceptable use policy. Uh, and then we'll also encourage them to purchase insurance. Um, so insurance can be purchased. Um, I worked with two different companies. One was a, a $29 a year for one student. Uh, the other one I'm working with is $49 a year uh, uh, for one student. Uh, difference in premiums uh, is because one, one insurance company um, takes care of all the paperwork uh, and does everything through an online portal. Uh, the school district doesn't have to do anything around it at all, um, and it's it's really it's been a really convenient process, uh, as opposed to another one, uh, which will uh, you'll have to actually do a little bit more paperwork. You'll have to work with the students um, uh, to get that claim filed, and maybe a clerical nightmare, uh, if you will, if you have multiple devices. So um, depending on Either one. Uh, we always recommend that students get some kind of insurance. Um, we treat, we try and treat the iPads no different than a textbook. Um, the one thing I've always said is that if you look at a, a student's textbook um, from any generation that had textbooks, and you add up the total cost of textbooks and the TI-84 calculators and everything else that went in the student's book bag, um, plus the cost of the actual backpack, you could probably buy three iPads. Um, so the idea of, of textbook costs. Uh, and all the costs that go into this um, one device, um, it, it really, it really kind of, it's really economical when you break it down uh, into those into those terms. So I want to bring up, um, I want to start to talk a little bit about the support and how we how we supported teachers, how we supported uh, students, how we supported uh, parents. And the first thing I want to talk about is is the professional development. Um, this was the, the biggest struggle because, as we know in education, uh, there are so many different policies and so many different um, initiatives that are constantly coming down the line, uh, and it's it's our job is to keep up with them. And a lot of times, professional development gets uh, eaten up by these days, whether it's uh, DDMs, uh, teacher evaluation, Common Core, you, know, you name it. Those those are the, usually the themes and the, the pieces that are focused on the district mandated PD days. Uh, so what we did at both Burlington um, and, and Grafton Public Schools is we tried to be subversive around professional development. Um, one of the best things we did in Burlington and in Grafton uh, for professional development is we included students. Uh, we felt the students were our best resource. Uh, and I look back on uh, all the great things I've seen that in, in the last five, four to five years, and one of the biggest takeaways is uh, a student tech team uh, that I helped create um, back in 2011. Uh, basically, what we did was we took the model that Apple had. Uh, if you've ever been to an Apple store on a Saturday and you walk in, um, you, see, you see tech support. Uh, you see uh, young kids in Apple t-shirts helping uh, you know, people that are my parents' age work with you know, adding photos or building a book or creating something. Uh, and so we basically looked at that model. Um, I talked with Apple um, Apple Genius Bar uh, professionals. I asked, I got hired, and I applied the same model to uh, a course that I created uh, called Student Help Desk. Uh, I, I created it four years ago at Burlington High School, uh, and that course has since taken off uh, and been replicated in multiple districts around the nation. Uh, we have several of them here in Massachusetts. Uh, we're very proud of um, any chance I get to speak with the students uh, that are in these courses. Um, I get very excited uh, because it's it's always great to see what they're doing. Um, and in the scope of a, a, a technology initiative, um, it's it's a no-brainer um, because what you can do is really provide that day-to-day -day support. Um, you know, one of, again, one of the reasons why we did this is we had we had three three district-wide tech uh, support. So three technicians, three network people or managers that could go around 
uh, throughout the entire district. We're responsible for projectors and iPads and, and everything. Um, and they just didn't have the time. Uh, so what we tried to do is we tried to take a lot of those tier one uh, troubleshooting issues and we, we brought the kids into the conversation. And so that was one of the, uh, I, I'd say one of the biggest um, biggest pluses that I've seen out of that. Uh, and I say that because I've seen kids that have taken a uh, help desk or have taken the tech force course and they've gone on to careers in this in this field. They've gone on to working in IT. They've gone on to internships with mobile technology companies. Um, and that's a pretty exciting, to be, uh, pretty exciting thing to see from a teacher standpoint. Um, I was able to get several students internships with mobile um, mobile development companies. Um, and so it, it it's not because of the iPad, but it's because they were given the opportunity to have this unique unique course. Um, and the course wasn't entirely troubleshooting. The course was focused around um, creating app uh, troubleshooting applications, breaking down a problem. Um, it was challenge-based learning in its in, in its essence. Uh, students were had required to provide support, uh, provide uh, tutorials. Um, they had they created a blog that uh, provided those those resources. We had districts that would come to me, uh, come to us, and still come to us, uh, and say they've used our student. Uh, help desk work for their professional development. They used it as a resource. Um, and ultimately, we were trying to create something around the lines of the a Khan Academy for, for ed tech support within our school. Uh, students interviewing, um, using Google Hangouts to interview uh, you know, business professionals. Um, they've spoke with Google. They've, they've gone down to visit Google uh, down in Cambridge. I took a group of students down there and uh, they sat with a group of engineers uh, at Google and, and had an experience uh, like no other. They they talked to them about uh, you know hacking uh, different different programs, about uh, open source content, uh, about programming, about what it takes to be a Googler, uh, and it was a great experience for them. And to see that was was you know, in my eyes, it's like wow, I wish I had this in school. Uh, I would have taken this course immediately. But I think I was taking a basic programming course. Um, where I was writing lines of code that just didn't really uh, fit my interest level at that time. Um, so um, I could talk all day about the student tech force, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll kind of hold off on that a little bit more. And if you have questions at the end, I can uh, refer you to some good resources around that, that, that initiative. Um, one of the other things um, I strive to do is, is develop, develop um, technology uh, PLCs within, uh, within our school, uh, in each school building. Uh, so one of the things that actually just came from one today at the high school, and it's it's basically a, a group where we get together and we we have uh, we have a, a meeting schedule, we have set norms, uh, and we discuss what's what's working and where we can improve, um, and we develop those plans together. So it's a it's a group of teachers. It's completely voluntary. It's, they're not required to be there. It happens after school, um, and we discuss technology, how it's working, how it's not. Um, I recently just uh, released a a. a a data collection tool around uh, student impact for uh, technology, so or how the students perceived our iPad one-to-one, -one, as well as how our teachers perceived our iPad one-to-one -one program in its fourth year. Um, and being relatively new in Grafton, I wanted to kind of get an idea of where this program had come from, um, a program that we had worked with at Burlington had helped them uh, launch it initially, um, but kind of seeing those two pieces of, of data come together uh, and, and, and visualizing it. So we talked about it today in our in our PLC and we discussed uh, some of the findings. I highlighted some of the themes and uh, it, it generated a really great conversation around where we're going with all this, reshaping our vision, uh, reshaping our goals and expectations around the iPad initiative, um, and how we can better support the teachers overall because that's something where I feel like uh, some of the pieces that came back were professional development. Um, they wanted more training. Um, they wanted more time um, to to really understand these tools. Uh, it, it, it's one of the, the things that it's always a it's always a constant in education dialogue where time is, is always something that's that we're fighting against. So uh, we're, we're looking for ways to try and Beat that conversation, try and beat time, if you will, uh, without having to create more time, which is um, impossible. 
Uh, so that's some of the things we were looking at um, and looking at ways in which when we have the professional development time, how do we use that time the best? Uh, one of the things we've done this year and I've done previous years is we've turned faculty meetings uh, into, uh, into ed camps. Uh, so if you're not familiar with uh, the ed camp model, ed camp model is a, um, in my sense, it's a, it's a blank slate uh, with, when it comes to a conference. It's a organic, uh, democratic professional development where everyone's voice matters. Uh, everyone can say, uh, you know, a question could be a, a, a session. Um, so it's really more of a, it's based on the idea of a conversation. So that's something that's really worked well for us and we, you know, we use that model for our professional development because it allows us to make the most of our time to, um, for teachers to really focus on a, a, certain, a certain piece of, that they, they need, to, need to work on. Um, so um, that's some of the things around professional development. Um, in, as far as the classroom practice goes, uh, anytime I talk to schools or consult with schools about iPads and Epic education or uh, any type of technology in education, I've always, I've always stressed the idea of finding a, a healthy balance. Um, technology is moving at a pace that it's hard to keep up with everything, um, though I attempt it. Um, and sometimes I get lost in it myself. But um, technology moves at a, at a, at a rate that's, that we're all kind of trying to keep up with. Um, and what I've always said is, is it's, it's not about, it's not about finding apps to teach history. It's not about finding apps to teach science. Um, we've hired all of our teachers on the basis that they're content experts, uh, and that's why they're hired. Whether we give them an iPad or um, you know, a, a talk slate, they're gonna be able to do great things. Um, and so what the iPad can do, what a Chromebook can do, is it can really elevate the way in which you engage students, uh, which you flip the physical space, uh, which you flip the classroom, uh, and it allows you to open up uh, new pathways that students may have not discovered before. Um, the idea of what does an assessment look like with an iPad, um, I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like every student in your class producing a PowerPoint of five slides with 15 pieces of text on each slide. That's what a, a project-based learning does not look like. What it does look like is it looks like a menu of options that students can use to create using the camera roll in their iPad to create a, an engaging presentation that's, that's actually speaking ab ab about and not just speaking from. Um, so those are some of the just kind of novel in which we learn to um, rethink the way we assess students, rethink the way we challenge our students daily, um, and just looking for different ways to leverage this device to its to full capacity. Um, so. At this point, uh, I'd like to kind of open up. Uh, I have some questions that I usually like to think about when you're either with the, while you're in a one-to-one -one or you're thinking about a one-to-one, -one, um, focusing on more on the classroom instruction piece and how we approach te technology. Uh, once we've been through the professional development, once we've been through training, and now we bring it into into play, um, what do those uh, pieces look like? So the first question. Uh, that Steve just posted up here on the stage is what is your instructional design process for integrating technology? So in that regard is this is kind of a, a broad question as far as how do you how do you plan technology into your into your classroom process, classroom procedures, classroom organization? Um, it, it, it is and it is a design process. It sounds like a much more fancy term than it needs to be, but in essence it really is. Uh, so how are we designing and, and integrating technology into our classrooms uh, as, as practitioners. So I'll give you a few moments to group up and um, uh, so we can just find somebody, pick somebody in the room, group up and uh, have that discussion for about, I'd say what, two, two to three minutes. And then uh, Sorry about that, Andy. I cut you off mid-sentence there. Uh, yeah, so you'll take you know just a couple minutes, group up. Uh, we'll say three minutes and uh, and talk about this question: What is your instructional design process for integrating technology? And then we can uh, start bringing some folks up and hearing their thoughts.
All right. So uh, we've had a few minutes to discuss what is your instructional design process for integrating technology. Uh, so what we can do right now is if uh, someone would like to come up on stage and just briefly uh, share uh, what they uh, got from their group um, or just um, uh, provide some feedback, uh, we, can, we can do that. Yeah, so if you want to come up, just raise your hand. Um, I don't know if, I know there's a couple of people that we know, Tom, or you know, I don't know if anybody else wants to uh, to share their thoughts. You can raise your hand and I will uh, bring you up. Or I'll just start picking people. We can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> Randomize it, yeah. I don't know if my microphone is working. I got it. Can you hear it? Yep. Okay. Um, since I'm no longer in a school, <laughs> I really can't can't answer the question. Uh, but but one of the things that, that stands out to me is all of the schools that try to implement these kinds of things without any pre planning on it. They, they kind of think that. We'll, we'll just get the stuff, we'll hand it out, and everybody will figure it out. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's a great point, Tom. I've, I've seen that, you know, uh, specifically around around students. Um, I think one thing that is working with an iPad is, is all of a sudden we dramatically change the way in which students learn, organize, gather, consume, and create within the context of a school day. Uh, by bringing this device in, uh, some school, some kids had had gone through 10, 11 years uh, of of learning a completely different system of, of schooling, uh, and not to say that that was a bad or a wrong system, um, but it was a dramatic change for a lot of students. Uh, students were kind of getting to the end of of their uh, high school careers, and so one of the things we noticed was that you know a lot of students weren't really apt to use this device as as they thought they would be. Um, Especially in the context of, of a high school student, where you have uh, a, a lot of a lot of competition, a lot of pressure around getting into college, um, and and a lot of those those um, vulnerabilities around that that time um, in your life is it, it can be very very um, intimidating to just take on this new device and expect uh, it to expect yourself to uh, acclimate to it as much as you did for a notebook uh, and, and a pen. Um, so that's something we noticed right away, and the assumption that um, just because someone's uh, under the age of 20 uh, doesn't mean that they're going to immediately adapt to a device able to use it in an educational context. Uh, so techn technology support uh, really focuses; it needs to be focused not only around the, the the teachers and what they can do to deliver the content, but then how are the students using the device to uh, create and author uh, a product or what they're learning. Uh, to show that, uh, and it, it can be kind of tough. Uh, the assumption that you could say, well, you know, at one time you gave every kid the, the focused instructions that led to a rubric that was really boxed in and really focused, uh, but now you say, okay, you know, finished product has these goals and should meet these expectations. Uh, choose your own app and create something. Um, and I've done that. I've done that in my class, and not too many students like it. They want to be told what to do. They want to be told what app they should do and how do they get to that that A. And so that's where you really need to kind of focus, like think about our instructional design uh, and see how we are going to take it from beginning to end uh, and how we're going to use that. Uh, you know, whether what no matter what kind of assessment we're going to use, um, how do we get kids to use the device so that they're using what they learned on that assessment. Uh, and, and, and applying and adapting those skills to either a project or a creative piece. Um, so that, um, that's, that was one of the big takeaways. And Tom, I thank you for mentioning the idea of, of just the assumption that throwing technology, airdropping technology into a school uh, is, is just going to create this, this magic all of a sudden and overnight. So. All right. Uh, I think we have the next question should be po uh, posting here on the stage pretty soon.
Um, how do you remix the physical space and leverage technology to create active learning spaces? Um, so this is a question that uh, I've always looked at as I mentioned it a little before. Look around at the, the space around the bricks and mortar uh, of our buildings. Um, and like I said, not too much has shifted in uh, actual uh, classroom aesthetic uh, in years. Uh, but with these devices, uh, hopefully these devices um, being mobile, being uh, having good battery and long battery life, um, can force uh, some new um, structures and design around how we how how we teach uh, and how or how we facilitate uh, a classroom. Uh, classrooms should not look like the background here on Shindig. It shouldn't be all the desks, the lines in the row um, that are all facing one way. Um, those were those were purposeful designs for a, a, a different time for for the industrial revolution. That's that's that was that is why that happened. Um, it wasn't. Uh, it was more for uh, you know a complacent society that would follow in line and follow follow the rules. That was that was the society that that time the workers were coming out to. Um, students today are coming out to a vastly different world. Um, they're going to be in a very a variety of different structures and different work uh, collaborations throughout their life. So how are we looking at the physical space uh, and how are we bringing that into our overall instructional design within a, a technology? Again, we'll do about two, two to three minutes. We'll pair up uh, and get some get some responses. All right, uh, so 
just uh, had a little bit of a conversation around uh, the question of how you remove the space, leverage technology to create active learning spaces. Um, I think due to time, we're going to have to um, slowly, slowly wrap things up, and I want to kind of have some, some time for uh, possibly some, some questions uh, and some places where I can put you in the in direction of resources. Um, but this question was more along the lines of the instructional design process and, and how we're designing instruction with uh, technology, whether it's machine devices to many, um, we should always think about, you know, how we're going to integrate it, how it's going to uh, impact student learning, um, but then also looking at something that we sometimes don't see is the physical space. How are we going to allow kids to uh, experiment and create uh, in an environment that's flexible and free so that by them going out in the hallway working on a project or um, you know, sitting on the floor or moving around is not going to be seen as something they, they think is bad, but something they, they think of as being a true collaborative space. Uh, and that's what these devices hopefully will provoke uh, coming down the line is we'll see more ways in which uh, students authentically collaborate uh, because the device or the, the challenge that the teacher is providing in that classroom um, demands it. Um, so again, I just want to wrap up with the kind of my first statement is that uh, regardless of the, the technology you, you incorporate, uh, true innovation in, in classrooms and school districts begins with trust. Um, if you don't have trust amongst on all levels, uh, all stakeholders, uh, if you're not having conversations with everyone involved, um, your, your, your initiative, no matter how big or how, how small it is, is, is really going to struggle. Um, and I say that because I think there needs to be a consistent conversation amongst all stakeholders, not just in the planning process, but throughout. Um, I still talk to the guys at Burlington uh, on a regular basis uh, that I worked with, um, Bob Kuna and Dennis Solano, and, and even Patrick Larkin I talk with uh, all the time. Um, the one thing, one of the hallmarks I think of our initiative is it worked well because we all, we all talked, we all challenged each other on a daily basis. Um, we didn't all just shake our heads and say, yeah, that's a great idea because I know you. Um, you know, we provoked each other's thought, we challenged each other to think differently. Um, and we, we made some, you know, took some crazy risks. Uh, ultimately, they paid off. And, uh, uh, you know, having those conversations consistently uh, and developing trust within your entire school district um, will ultimately help you uh, get to where you want to be with your technology initiative. Uh, so, Steve, I don't know if we have time for uh, any questions, but uh, if there are any questions, um, I can take them now or I can even take them offline uh, via Twitter. I'm um, available um, at Andy Sinek, A-N-D-Y-C-I-N-E. Okay. Uh, if I'm there, time. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out and uh, shoot me a question. But, uh, thank you for this, this opportunity today. It was great to speak. Uh, I feel like I could speak on this subject for, for hours. and. Um, but I thank you guys for the opportunity. So uh, there actually is, uh, Kathy wanted to know what is the uh, the insurance that you mentioned? What is that? What does that cover? The insurance covers pretty much everything except um, you know under the hood damage. And uh, so, for example, if a if a video card goes wonky, uh, it doesn't cover that. Um, if a student forcibly smashes his or her iPad because they had a bad visit. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, so, um, uh, I've I've seen an array of of claims that students have tried to make. Uh, you know, the most we get, the majority of the claims we get are either uh, it dropped it in water, or something spilled on, or we have a cracked screen. Uh, so those are mostly the, the pieces. Um, I've had a student that uh, someone broke into her car, stole the iPad. With the police report, uh, she was able to file a claim and everything, everything went well. So, um, yeah. Yeah, if anybody else has a, a question, they can go ahead and submit that. And, or you can raise your hand and I can bring you up. I'll give you just a second. While we're waiting, tell us the name of your book and tell us where we can get it. Yes, the name of the book, and I'll just do it. I have product placement right here. Look at this. Oh, okay. <laughs> So the name of the book is the uh, one to one roadmap setting the course for innovation in education. Uh, it can be purchased through uh, Um 
uh, just searching either my last name or the name of the book. Um, I think it's also available on Amazon, uh, but they always seem to not have it in stock. So either that's really good uh, or um, <laughs> I don't know, perhaps uh, for, for my book, um, as well as a, a lot of other great books uh, around education and educational technology and philosophy. Well, thank, thank you so much for uh, for our conversation today. I know as somebody who was uh, was previously involved in a, in a, a BYOD initiative, um, lots of great things. And even I learned a couple of, of new things today, too. So I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Um, just a few things to wrap us up. Um, again, everybody um, go out and check out uh, Andy's book. Uh, definitely. You're, you're definitely going to want to check that out. Um, and uh, again, we want to thank everybody for joining us. For interactive, we have a couple of upcoming events. Um, next week on the 21st at 8 p.m., you can catch Don Wetrick. Um, he's the author of Pure Genius, Building a Culture of Innovation. Um, he's kind of a leader in the 20-time uh, uh, innovation class kind of movement in, in schools, and he's going to talk a little bit more about what he's doing in his class um, that he has on innovation, and, uh, and you'll, you'll be sure to want to check that out. And we've got a couple other new sessions that are getting added, and uh, we actually have some, uh, some that we need to go ahead and put in there for, uh, for February. So you'll want to visit edchatinteractive.org. Thanks again for joining us. We hope that you enjoy this EdChat Interactive. And uh, my name is Steven Anderson, and on behalf of, of Mitch Weisberg and Tom Whitby, um, thanks, and we'll see you next time.